Welcome, Captain Jack Harkness and Captain Jack Harkness, to episode 422 of An Unearthly Podcast, streaming live on the 28th of September, 2021, and featuring Torchwood, Captain Jack Harkness, written by Captain Trigana, and starring John Barrowman as Captain Jack Harkness, Eve Miles as Gwen Cooper, Byrne Gorman as Owen Harper, Naoko Mori as Toshiko Sato, and Gareth David Lloyd as Yanto Jones. I am Bill Sylvia, the writer in black, and how many times can I say Captain Jack Harkness in one intro? With me are Randy Ronson McCulloch. Uh, I think you also forgot uh, Matt Rippey as Captain Jack Harkness. Mad Matt Winchell. I live... And Thomas Fireheart. Good thing he ain't Beetlejuice, otherwise you're probably summoned him by now. <laughs> oh my. And yet, this this does not count as the equivalent of a multi-doctor story. They are not <laughs> the same guy. <laughs> Come to think of it, I don't think we've ever seen young Jack and old, well, relatively young Jack and old Jack crossover. No, no, we mm. have not. Unless Knowing him, he'd invite himself to a room. <laughs> and that's amazing, considering if you know anything about Jack, Captain Jack Harkness' life, how many times he's actually been thrown back in time and had to live the same damn years over again. Yeah. In this episode, when uh, when she asked if he had been to World War II before, I was sitting there counting on my fingers like one, two, three, four. Uh, <laughs> he's been here a few times. <laughs> <laughs> you ever wonder how utterly boring that would be <laughs> I mean how many times you would sit through the same sports event going I know how this is going to end on the other hand you could make a killing bit making bets <laughs> <laughs> Sh with, with shut up and listen to the radio butthead <laughs> With some of the shows I've watched multiple times, I imagine certain events can't be too different from that. True. So, how's everybody's week been? I know mine's been kind of blah. Uh, really quick in the chat, Wolf and Forest uh, has appeared again and uh, admits that they accidentally went to my channel first. Uh, <laughs> uh, so my week, I have my sleep schedule is still uh, in it's it's. Even though I try to be good, it just gets worse instead. So two nights ago, I took uh, the generic equivalent of ZZ Quill for the first time. I did not last night because I was afraid it would make me sleep more than the like four or five hours that I had before I needed to wake up. As a result, and also because of a burrito I ate, I probably only got one hour of sleep last night. Um. So I think I'm going to stick to that at least a little bit. I don't want to become dependent on them, mm. but I also don't want to never sleep or to sleep until 2 p.m. every day. So and avoid, I'm going and avoid to... those burritos, huh? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not ordering a burrito from that particular food court again. <laughs> Ooh. Oof. Was risking was 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 uh, dining risky, huh? I don't know if it was bad, but I do know that. Um, even though it wasn't all that spicy coming in, it uh, it burned more than it should have coming out. Oh, so, uh oh! I fight uh, with a burning ring of fire. <laughs> it's an angry sphincter. It, it was just not a pleasant night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Matt, how was your week? Speaking of work and schedules. I've worked since last week Tuesday until today, every single fucking day. Mm. And yeah. actually, it wouldn't be too bad if it wasn't for the fact that uh, Sunday was a late shift, which meant I had to at least work until eleven thirty. We go over if we have things that we need to finish before we leave the store, as just as long as we're out of there before one. And it also wouldn't have helped. It would have helped if it wasn't that late shift, which we did run late, and. Then I had to immediately come back at 9 o'clock in the morning the next day. Ouch, I hate it when they schedule that. And I'm lucky if I can get to bed between, like, 1 and 2 in the morning, as usual. Mm. No matter how hard I try. 
and even make the things even better, I had to go back to work on Monday because two hour store uh store meeting. <laughs> so I had to run off for like an hour, two and a half hours, and then immediately come back. Um, that being said, uh, I mentioned that one of our food products was being switched up for another, uh, uh, our wedges for, um, potato, uh, yeah, but, uh, the fry waffle fries. Uh -huh. Tried them. Not only are they not bad, they taste exactly the same as our old wedges did. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> to which I have to, to sit here and go, then why the change? This must be a corporate thing for some reason. Sometimes it's the they only just want logic to make that makes sense. <laughs> Sometimes they just want to make things look new because then customers will be like, "Ooh, shiny, new thing." The wedges are relatively new. <laughs> well, uh -huh. here's the thing: wedges are like passe. They're like not popular anymore, which is why I'm stopping them. I don't understand it. I'm a wedge person. I love it, potatoes. How are they not popular when literally every grocery store makes them? I don't see them around here. Well, I don't know what on earth they're doing in Madison then because they make them everywhere here. There isn't a grocery store within the next three towns that doesn't have potato wedges in their store. As a deli item, if, at the very least. I don't see them in any of our hot delis. Not at Woodman's. Mm -hmm. Not I don't at know Ivy. Where... Not at Metcalf's. And nobody else counts because nobody else is big enough to have a hot deli. That's a lie, Piggly Wiggly. Not one in Madison. Well, <laughs> well, there's plenty of Piggly Wigglies I, not in Madison that are big enough to have hot delis, and I believe there's a couple of centuries and pick and saves that also have them and are big enough to have hot delis. Um, centuries all gone here now. There are some pick and saves, but I've never eat there. I, I mean, I never shopped there. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, mm, how do you mean divine this? Um, I've shopped there <laughs> occasionally. Um, there's one West Bend on my mother's way home. I yeah, have burgers all, from there. The They're good. Saves around here used to be cops. I'm more or less in the Midwest now, but I still don't recognize any of those brands. Jeez. <laughs> I say more or less because even just looking at an academic standpoint, in some in some discipline, like in some subjects, it's considered mid Atlantic, and in some subjects, it's considered Midwest. So I'm just in yeah. between. Yeah, a lot of the the places we mentioned um, are served the like the Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois mm. area, the deep Midwest. <laughs> The Great Lakes region, the the Western Great Lakes region. Um, Hy-Vee, I think, is pretty much national. Um, if not, they will be. How Woodman's do you spell that? H y hyphen v e e. Um, so I definitely would not have gotten that just by trying. Woodman's is Wisconsin <laughs> local only. It's actually like it has like only five stores, maybe six. Yeah, they're all locally owned. And Metcalf's has two stores, or one or two stores, and um, is very locally owned. Uh, Aaron used to work there, and is now glad she doesn't. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, we're changing that food item for whatever reason. We are also going to be changing our boxes soon. We're going to have a pizza sale this next month. Uh, and I think we've got like three more drinks coming out over the next two months. Mm. Well, if that changes global, I may have to try their waffle fries just to see. I yeah, mean, like I, I said, they taste exactly like our potato wedges did, and I'm fine with them. Just curious why they decided they need to be enforced into a change already. Yeah, well, like I mm. said, they've pretty much dominated the uh, the Madison market mm. for convenience stores now, so. Mm. I can pretty much go there and actually I can go down the street about five blocks and run into one now. Yeah. And you can Whereas get, you I, can I actually, you probably to... can get attendees with uh, waffle fries for like three bucks, four bucks. Yeah. 
whereas like two three years ago to get to one i had to go like clear the hell like 30 blocks away and now there's like four of them within 10 blocks of they'll, my, they'll have tendies car. they'll have waffle fries still have boneless wings both uh buffalo and barbecue now mm. um have full-on roasted chicken eight-piece chicken etc is, is is this is this a flyer this is just the, this is just the chicken. If you want me to go into the sandwiches and the, the breadsticks, I can go into no, there and no, the and no, the pizzas. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm just saying stop, what I've been stop eating. Stop for... selling your work here, Matt. I'm talking about what I've been eating for the last week because that's what I have to do in order to get home. <laughs> I got to eat oh, one, at least one meal a day at work. <laughs> so it looks like Hy-Vee is mostly in Kansas City and Des Moines. And then kind of spread across that region and uh, between there and Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Well, they're 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 a rapidly spreading mm. grocery store. I mean, it's becoming as big as Publix is in the South, and uh, um, I can't remember what ones the in the in the West these days because it's been a while since I've been to the uh, the uh, Pacific states. Um. Anyway, Thomas, how about you? Uh, not much. Basically, just work. Um, and continuing to stream pretty much every day except those days. <laughs> um, and it's funny. Like, I know a lot of people don't and whatever, but like, I stream for such a small amount of time that it's just like, eh. like, if I if I had a way of telling like what people were more likely to what days people were more likely to like come through and like just sort of check me out and then leave or whatever the fuck or whatever like if i was able to tell that by the analytics then maybe i'd be like okay so i'll stream these days and take all of these days off or whatever but it's like eh um because i stream because uh, i work nights and uh oh, thursday nights and then it's like after that it's like <laughs> i don't know if my brain would really want to function streaming anymore <laughs> short of just like um i mean i did do a test yesterday and realized that nope uh streaming gameplay from my laptop is definitely out of the question <laughs> <laughs> but at the very least, doing essentially something like we're doing right now would not be out of the realm of possibility. Um, so I might get into like doing just chatting sort of streams. Uh, but I don't have a webcam, or at least I don't have a decent one because I don't think the one on this laptop is all that great. <laughs> so it'll probably just be like, again, like we're doing now where it's purely a disembodied voice <laughs> my, my well, laptop is relatively new and relatively okay i won't say expensive because it's not a gamer laptop but it's mid-range it's expensive for an act for me um and even still my phone has had a better camera than my laptop ever for the entire time i've had it so phones just keep <laughs> updating their cameras much more quickly <laughs> well thomas there's always another option you could always become a vtuber <laughs> oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure the computer would take that either. It depends. Yeah. If he's if it's just a 2D thing, it can run it just fine. I would assume they're a lot less strain. I, I've mm, heard I mean, I've heard a lot of VTubers have to update their rigs before they can go th full 3D. Yeah, you know, like uh, I've had this, I've had this laptop for God. Let's see, um. Definitely since before I rejoined the podcast. At least I'd say 2014 or 2015, maybe. So, <laughs> um, I think it's just this computer this laptop... since long before that. Actually, I think I've been yeah, running like... on this computer since we started this podcast. <laughs> mm. Either way, I'm just saying, like, I think this laptop's on its, not so much its last legs, but it has a lot 
more trouble these days processing yeah. shit than it used to. Um, Laptops are really know... not built to last a very long time, to be fair. Because mm. yeah, I know, like, you're supposed, cut... to, you're supposed to update them every two to three years, five at the outmost. Mm. And um, people do, like, every 10, 15 years if they can. Mm. Like, I know, uh, I mean, it's funny because I used to be able to stream, and I don't know, maybe it's because I was trying it with Streamlabs OBS instead of just OBS. Um, but I know years ago, I was able to stream, uh, certain games off my pc with the settings turned way down like i know i did uh well and some were just because they were basic enough like undertale i did at least a stream of um i did at least one or two streams of like uh star wars the old republic so the star wars mmr um and I think there was an oh, and even friggin' Final Fantasy fourteen. But again, that would have been with the graphics turned like way down. Mm. Um, but even then, it was like, wow, my my laptop used to be able to manage that, and now it's like, no, you can't play this indie game. That while it's three D graphics and everything, it's not exactly gra- graphics intensive, but it's still more than, <laughs> um my pc can uh the, the, more than my laptop can handle to stream it without dropping a million frames yeah. <laughs> seemingly um so it was like okay no yeah my my audio is fine coming through but the gameplay is just janky so yeah oh well, uh, speaking of gaming really quick i have tried out final fantasy 2 pixel uh, perfection uh, or no pixel remake sorry i keep messing up how that name goes uh final fantasy 2 pixel remake Pixel remaster. Pixel remaster. Re- I think there's like five different ways they've worded it. Anyways, the new version <laughs> of Final Fantasy 2. The visuals have been upgraded. The sound has also been upgraded. I actually really like their fine their new version of the uh, the theme ba- the battle theme, but the gameplay still sucks. <laughs> and can you still infinitely power yourself up by beating on yourself? It's the only way to level up. And it's like, nope, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> when literally the only way to actually upgrade your character so they don't instantly die is to literally have them fight each other i think i'm done i'm moving on to three <laughs> i literally just turned it on long enough to get all the cards so i can sell the cards to get more final fantasy one cards okay um <laughs> moving on ahead. to tonight's show we've got birthdays um we have some big news yep uh we have um some geek talk apparently uh People can tell what season it is by what's getting re- getting reviewed. <laughs> by a couple um, of things, yep. And then we are on to our episode summary, our review, our final thoughts, and our ratings. So, starting with birthdays, uh, we last bro- uh, we last broadcasted on September twenty first, the first birthday on our list, September twenty second, and that is the birthday of Billy Piper, who played Rose Tyler from two thousand five two thousand six season. Came back for the 2009 season and was in the 50th anniversary special in 2013. She turned 39. Also, uh, same day, is the birthday of Fraser Hines, who played Jamie McCrimmon back with the second Doctor era from 67 to 69. Uh, turned up again for the 50 uh, for the 20th anniversary special in 83. And then did a one-shot with the... Uh, uh, six Doctor Colin Baker in 1985. He turned 77. Uh, moving forward to the 24th, sees the birthday of David Banks, uh, who played the Cyber Leader from Earthshock in 1982 through Silver Nemesis in 88. He turned 70. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> and then in the uh, 26th is the birthday of Leonard Sachs. He played uh, President Barusa in Ark of Infinity, 1983. He would have been 112, but he died in 1990 at the age of 80. And finally, the 27th sees the birthday of Dominant Glynn, who was the composer from 1986. Back during the Trial of a Time Lord season, he turned 61. So, happy birthday to Billy, Fraser, David, Leonard, and Dominic. Moving on into the new section. We finally 
know who will be replacing Chris Chibnall as showrunner for Doctor Who? And the answer is, it's Russell T. Davies, the man who brought Doctor Who back to us in 2003 to through 2005, has returned to take control of the show. Can I get a hell yes, please? <laughs> it's definitely a first for the series. I think we might have had producers step down for the span of one episode due to not being allowed to produce an episode they had written, but we've never had a showrunner or producer seriously leave and come back in that way in Doctor Who history. No, we mm. haven't, but this is a new, you know, this production is a new production. And mm. to be honest, ever since Russell left at the end of 2009, it's Dr. been a Who slow downhill, slow decline. A few times <laughs> it looked like it was upturning, but mm -hmm. Moffitt the spikes in the back down again. <laughs> Moffat was nowhere near the showrunner that Russell P. Davies was, and Chibnall is nowhere near the producer uh, Moffat was. Um, Quality's down. Value of the show is down. Ratings are down. And the BBC is, of course, very desperate to do something about that. <laughs> um, they want to bring back the classic high ratings and good feels that came in during the Davies era. And what better person to do that than Davies himself? Yes, place for sugar I mean, on top. Uh, Take all my money. I mean... I mean, I am. <clears throat> I mean, I like. I I kind of agree with a a YouTuber I follow who did a video on this. It was like, I hope he actually like approached them about coming back. So it's actually he's a he actually has new ideas and that that he wanted to play with. And he was like, hey, you know fuck it, I'm in a place in my career where I feel like I can come back to this and do something new rather than them basically begging him to come back and him kind well, of being uh, like... Well, I don't oh, care I who can't. asks who first, as long as he's actually, yeah, willingly doing this because he's got plans. From yeah. what we've... From, from the way we've been seeing, like, looking at things and talking about it since Chibnall announced he was stepping down, I think the BBC did call up Russell and beg him, like, we can't find anybody else please come back and uh, restore our ratings. However, mm -hmm. Russell did say in, in the past he had no interest in coming back. I'm hoping that means that he does, you know, that there is something major that he's seriously thinking of or has planned. And it's not just literally, mm. you know, we'll give you the biggest boatload of money the BBC can actually find <laughs> uh, in exchange for coming back. Yeah, because like if it's just a retread of his first run, then eh, I'd rather not. I'd rather go back to a retread um, of his first run than to continue the way that things are going. I don't think that's possible just because socially and politically things have changed so much since 2005 that even if mm. RTD wanted to make the exact same show, it would still come out as a different show. Mm. That's quite true. Um, things have actually changed drastically since 2015. So, <laughs> um, yeah, like it's funny because I, as as blindly like who as some people are, I'm also like, okay, so the guy who gave us the end of time, Last of the Time Lords, uh, World War Three, Aliens of London, <laughs> that kind of stuff. The guy who allowed Chibnall to write Cyber Woman is coming back, like. Mm. I like time. how you <laughs> literally the worst everything that he's done. I am yeah. not I mean, saying... like, he did, like, most of the stuff he wrote himself, I'm not as keen on as the stuff other people did under him. Oh, yeah, I have never <laughs> said Davies was the world's greatest writer. <laughs> no, no, yeah. mediocre writer. What he's great at is mm. what all these other producers have been failing at. He is an excellent script editor. He's, mm. at, he's great at taking storylines and tying them together in a com in a progressive storyline. Mm. Um, he's great at all of that. He's great at he's basically great at everything you need somebody to do behind the scenes 
and he's a decent enough writer that you're not usually disappointed in his episodes, with the exception of Love and Monsters, mm-hmm. which was <laughs> which kind of you forced know, on him. <laughs> Which was yes, he was mm. kind of forced under duress on that one. And and I would yeah. think for and I mean and you can you can write the ones I'm about to say off as uh, as fan wanky and you might they might not be your taste, but uh, you know at least for me, for every episode that you mentioned that isn't that great, he had another you know uh, be, uh, journey's end, uh, parting of the ways, and other brilliant episodes like that. Turn left was that his. Mm. No. Oh, actually, that might have been. It yeah, have because been. it technically tied into the next episode. Mm-hmm. Next couple episodes. Mm-hmm. Um, An Army of Ghosts Doomsday was um, actually yep. like the ultimate fan yeah. wank episode. Yes. <laughs> yes, it was, but oh. it was glorious. Oh, it was glorious. I mean, you know, he basically said, all right, this season we're ending it with Daleks versus Cybermen. And, and you just could hear the room go, Ooh. Although yes. I, I do find it funny that some people are acting as if he would necessarily automatically try to... I mean, like, for all we know, Chibnall might but before he leaves, but or there might be, like, some added twist to the Timeless Child thing. But some people are acting mm. as if, like, he's going to immediately renege on that. And it's like, we're are we forgetting that this is the guy who gave us Space Jesus' 10th Doctor? Like... <laughs> That's uh, because people think bringing back an old person <laughs> that they remember with nostalgia goggles will automatically get rid of things that they don't like about new things. Hmm. Like, I'm pretty sure he's actually... Like, whether he said it or not, I could see him liking the Timeless Child thing and not necessarily fucking with it unless there was, like... Oh, he'll fuck Unless with he it, runs but... with it, and then there's so much backlash that he's like, "Okay, fine." <laughs> he'll, I mean, he may run with it, but he would twist it in a way to make it work. Yes, mm. please, because uh, where it stands what, right now, I hate I it. Like <laughs> about Russell T. Davies is his mind works the same way mine does. Every time Russell T. Davies put a twist in Doctor Who, and I'm not talking about freaking blowjob concrete block. <laughs> I'm talking like series ending, like big revelation twists. I'm like, yes, exactly. <laughs> it just it's like it worked within the own framework that I saw the Doctor Who universe. Hmm. So we clicked on that same level. I say I will say one thing that's very different about RTD and Moffat is Moffat probably if he came back, he would have gone five years and never mentioned that twist once ever again. RTD, I think it would at least he would at least do something with it. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, I guess even the if, other, even if it's to prove that it's not really true, mm. he will do um, something with it. Yeah, of course. The other funny thing is I've seen people seem to be under the implication that, uh, uh seem to be like delusional enough to think that. RTD is somehow going to be less political than Chibnall. The difference will be that's nostalgia goggles. Yeah, the the difference will be that, and the way I feel like I've either seen it pointed out or pointed out to people myself uh... is that the difference between Chibnall and RTD when it comes to the political stuff will be RTD will be probably better at doing an actual like sci-fi spin on it Mm -hmm. rather than just being directly on the nose about it. Like that will be the difference. It'll still be very political. RTD was very political, but it will be, the difference will be they'll actually probably be sci-fi spins on it. And that makes all the difference to me. Yes. All the difference. Because it is too damn blunt and it's Mm. actually getting irksome because it's not fun. Yes. I mean, you know, Star Trek is political, but they weave it into the story enough that you're enjoying a sci-fi story, even if it has a political message. Doctor Who, in its classic era, was political, but they weave the message into the story. Chibnall, however, hits you over the hammer with the political message. I, uh, now, if we turn into weaving the political message into the story... I'm cool with that. Although I'm wondering, in 2005, 
did people consider Captain Jack as weaving the political message into the story, or did they consider that as hitting you over the head with a gay hammer? Oh, I considered it weaving it into the story. I mean, yeah, Jack was Jack. I mean, it was just like Jack was just Jack. You, you were just. I mean, at the time, you were just overly, you know, marvelled by how awesome he was mm -hmm. to to worry about the political message. I mean, you remember I was watching back then. Yeah. Hmm. I, I was watching although, back then because of Randy. <laughs> <laughs> although it is kind of funny that some people are like the people who would call in like, you know, diversity like that. The people who would call that political are trying to act as if RTD somehow wasn't, which, again, is very much nostalgia blindness. Yeah, it's like very much he's nostalgia. the one who gave us that. He gave us the first black companions in Doctor Who history. Yeah. Like. That's not going away. <laughs> no, and, you know, I didn't mind that kind of thing. Mind you, I did mind Mickey for a while, because... <laughs> well, Mickey was Mickey for a while, you know? Yeah. Was, I, I'm sure it was his attitude and his role, his relationship with Rose probably more than anything else. Yeah. Mm. The fact that he was basically a lost puppy following Rose around. Yeah. That's the one thing I'm not going to like is the return to there's something about X. <laughs> and mind you, Moffat, of course, hit us over the head with there's something about X. Right. There's yeah. something about Amy. There's something about Clara. But it started with Davies with there's something about Rose. Hmm. Oh, Rose is gone. I'm so sad I miss Rose. Although, to be oh, fair, yeah. that started with Cartmel and Ace. Hmm. Eh, it wasn't as obsessive. I mean, yes, she was getting her own storylines, but the Doctor, as the character, was not obsessed with Ace. Mm. And that's what that was my problem. Not so much that the character was getting big storylines, is the Doctor's obsession with the character. Mm. I mean, I mean, it got bad during the Moffat era, where you had frickin' Matt Smith as the creepy stalker in Clara's timeline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um... And even by that extension, I think of the three RTD companions, Martha was the only one who didn't have some sort of mystery box thing going on. Because yeah. there was ultimately the, the of, Dr. Donna thing. Of the main the main companions, yeah, yeah. not the secondaries. Yeah. Uh related to related to um some of the things we're talking about with storytelling, Thomas and I were talking off stream about this. Um and I mentioned the big difference that uh, RTD has compared to Chibnall and even compared to Moffat is that he has written and produced a variety of shows for children, adults, and families, whereas Moffat and especially Chibnall primarily has produced drama shows for adults without really having, uh, without really having the experience at the childlike wonder side of Doctor Who. Yes. Uh, that mm. RTD has a lot of experience writing with. And RTD knows to write sci-fi, something Chibnall does not know how to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so all in all, even if it's not going to be the same, which it's not, I still think this is an improvement. Because we're getting somebody who knows how to write sci-fi, who knows how to hire sci-fi authors of uh, you know, no, knows to look for people that know how to write science fiction instead of drama. Mm. Knows or how the to very edit least. these people. So even if his own creative juices are not that flowing, he knows how to at least work with others to get it done to edit the scripts. Mm. At the very um, least, I could see him being better at helping some of the writers Chibnall brought on. Um, Maybe. To make more like sci-fi spins on the stuff they were doing than... Honestly, they might just Chibnall be so bad at sci-fi that he might actually um, decide that they need to still move along and get some new ones in. <laughs> he might, he might um, crib one or two of the better ones. Yeah. But I suspect mm. the majority of the writing staff is going to be replaced. I wouldn't. I would also not be surprised if ch the first thing Chibnall does is call up Murray Gold and go, "Please come back." You mean the first <laughs> thing RTD does? 
Yeah, RTD does. It's I, call up Murray Gold. Go, Please come back. I, I saw <laughs> people debating on Twitter whether Murray Gold should come back or not. Um, mm. Compared to the current person, I think so. Yes, please. Um, when, music, when was the last time we had a really good theme for Doctor Who? It's been a while. A really, well, not the theme. To, well, not, not, the well, not even just the main itself. theme. I mean, just background music theme. Yes, yes. There's not really been a case of epic background music. I've never felt the urge to buy the soundtracks to series 11 or 12. I freaking love almost all the soundtracks from the previous series. Um, I do think, and you know, Murray Gold have, having had a few years off, might have gotten some creative mojo back because I do mm -hmm. think he was flagging near the end. Yeah, he was starting to flag, and he admitted it, mm -hmm. as I recall. Because um, it's yeah, you know, it's hard to keep doing the same thing over and over again. Mm. But well, I um, think, like, I, f I forget if I talk to this about Bill or not, probably not, but I know one thing that came to mind as a potential positive for this is that my main hope from this is that one of RTD's goals is essentially building up new potential showrunners. That would, that <laughs> that would, would be, also be great. Um, I'm, I'm cause, hoping. Because I could see him Having like, cause you know, like Chibnall was someone that they basically had to beg to come in, um. Mm -hmm. So he probably wasn't really focused on that, thinking about oh, I need a successor at all. Um. Whereas you know, we got both Chibnall and Moffat from, uh, RTD's run, so it would make sense to me for rtd to have a focus on okay let's build up some of these people to potentially take over when i leave because yes. i'm obviously not going to be doing this forever <laughs> on, on a related that... note um before the chibnall era and before the very late moffat era i remember the doctor who uh behind like the, the crew side the behind the scenes the writers and producers there was a lot of criticism that it was primarily um just white men drawn from the industry I think RTD has enough, uh, he's been in the industry long enough and been like on different, different aspects of doing sci-fi and doing, you know, this sort of television that he probably has the connections to continue, um, diversifying, you know, but, but with people who are familiar with sci-fi stories and things like that. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, uh, uh, Davies, when he left, left good faith in Moffat, who was one of his better writers. It didn't quite work as well, but Mo Moffat, during his run, was kind of hoping that Gaddis would be his replacement. Mm. And so he kept trying to feature a Gaddis story to get him to, a, you know, to establish himself as a good writer. The problem is Gaddis never really succeeded at that. Mm. The best he would do would be a couple of mediocre episodes. Yeah, I think he had one good one near the end, but nothing really great and outstanding. <laughs> so when Moffat left, he didn't really have anybody to replace him. In fact, he actually wound up taking extra season beyond when he wanted to step down because they couldn't find a replacement. Mm. Um, and then... I, it took a lot of persuading to get Chibnall to take the take the reins, mm. and that of course ended horribly. <laughs> um, one thing about Davies is that he is a fan; he is a colossal Doctor Who fan. So, mm -hmm. and, and I guess that's a funny thing. A fan, I think he has a respect for the the background of the series. Like, I think that's also the funny thing, too. I feel like I can remember, um, there being, uh, an interview snippet that I remember seeing where it was, like, Davies and Moffat, and both were asked if they still thought about ideas for Doctor Who, and Davies was very much, oh, yeah, all the time, and Moffat was like, nope, <laughs> like, yeah. that part of my life's over, I'm yeah. done. Um, whereas Davies is pretty much always, it probably explains why he's done stuff with Big Finish in that, because it's like, he still wants to be involved, he just was like, okay, I'm done being the showrunner, but that didn't stop, uh, the idea process in his head. 
Ironically, mm-hmm. um, that's the same interview where if they asked if they would ever come back, they both said no, <laughs> which we talked about earlier. I remember that yeah. interview pretty well. But, <laughs> you know, it has been at least because I think that was at the I think that was at the end of Moffat's run when they did that interview. Hmm. So I think like that was just before like the first season of Chip, like just before season 11, series 11 started. So I think um, um, a lot has changed since 2017. Mm. So four years is enough for Russell T to change his mind. So it could be that he said, okay, I'll come back and I'll do this. You need somebody to help revitalize the show. I'm your man. Yeah. Which again, like if it's that hard for them to try getting other showrunners again, that's why I'm like, well, we got two out of Davies basically <laughs> so stands to reason that him coming back he could potentially uh, help to groom the next generation of showrunners and of course um, apparently Davies had some conditions uh, <laughs> starting in 2023 the show will be co-produced between BBC Studios and Bad Wolf Productions that was the production company created by Julie Gardner. So it's once again going to be Davies and Gardner making the show. Mm. Like it was back in series one, two, and three. Um, and the fact that Jane Tranter, also part of Bad Wolf Production, was the BBC head of drama. So, mm. these are three people that were involved in Doctor Who back during the Davies era. And I'm pretty sure Davies could call some old crew and say, let's get the band back together. Oh, and I will say, now that we um, are losing Chibnall and getting RTD back, I do want another female doctor after Jody, just so it can be pointed out that the issue was Chibnall and not... <laughs> Jody, yeah. like very I, I, much. To so, me, like, the only way to officially say that was if Jody was um, to stay on for one more season of Russell and just prove well, that she's part of me not a bad doctor. Yeah, like that's just the issue there. Given given the implication seems to be that we're getting the 60th and then a series from RTD rather than a series to introduce a new Doctor and then the special makes me almost want rtd to really talk jody into doing the 60th and regenerating at the end of it um so we can keep her around for that and then move into a new doctor with the series rather than having to introduce an entirely new doctor with the 60th (laughs) because that would feel really weird i don't know there's always it, it with the new who it always seems like every time there's a new showrunner there's a new doctor I mean, you think about it, Russell T. Dave. It's not always true that there's always a new showrunner with a new doctor, but mm. when David Tennant regenerated into Matt Smith, that was the same time that Russell T. Davies left and Stephen Moffat took over. Mm. When Peter Capaldi regenerated into Jodie Whittaker, that was the same time Moffat stepped down and Chibnall took over. Yeah. So now we're which I mean, at- which also means we're losing both Yaz and probably this new guy that we only just got that we're only just getting because usually it's the entire slate is wiped clean. Mm-hmm. <laughs> However, at least usually from New Who, but not always classic. Yeah. With yeah, Who, yeah. Mind you, under Russell T, there was you know the only companion that lasted longer than a season was uh, Rose, mm-hmm. and that's because she lasted through two Doctors. Um. She lasted through um, Eccleston's only and Tenet's first. But then after that, mm. Martha was a season. Donna was a season. So. Then the specials alone. Yeah. Mm. So that's not unusual, and that might be what we go back to. Mm. I mean, same- personally, I would like to see what RTD could do with Yaz if if she does get it to stick around, but we'll see. Yeah, that's that might be a little hard to do. Mm. Uh, because Davies might want to start fresh. I don't know. It's mm. going that's going to be a debate for the ages. Um 
And again, we don't know if he's going to be starting with the 60th anniversary. All they have been saying is that he's going to take the helm for the 60th anniversary. Um, yeah, and, it's, and the wording is like 60th and series beyond. So yeah, the, but every article you look at words it differently. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing sure about any of this right now until somebody actually gets an exact all we quote know, about what's going down. All that we know is that we it has been stated that the centennial in 2022 or the centenary, excuse me, the BBC centenary. <laughs> is going to be Whitaker's last, and it's going to be Chibnall's last. Mm. After that, the production is going for the 2023 season, and they call it a season. They don't call which series it is or anything, but they said everything behind that is going to be Davies. Mm. As, they, as of yet, the new Doctor is yet to, is yet to be announced, but I'm sure Davies is already considering candidates. Oh yeah. Um, Though at this point, I hope we don't find out until like we're ju either a we're just about to lose Jody, or b we actually get a fucking surprise for once <laughs> in New Who, and they don't tell us, and we have to find out by watching the damn thing. <laughs> I don't. We'll we'll have mm. to see. I mean, it's it's going to be Davy's call with me, so. Hmm. Uh, well, yeah, I would assume also he'll me, Davies he'll call be. as to how close to chess he plays everything. Yeah, and I mean, there are rumors mm. all over the place. Um, one rumor I saw recently was that there that Matt Smith was talking about being able to come back, and it's like, eh. <laughs> well, I would agree. It would be interesting to see how Russell would handle Matt. Mm -hmm. Just as a, you know counterpoint to how it was under Moffat. Yeah. Mm. Just to prove how different a show would be with, under Russell's control. Personally, mm. I would have loved to have seen Davies and Capaldi work together. That would have been amazing. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, I mean, depending on whether or not the 60th is a multi-doctor story, it could potentially happen. Yeah, that's true. That is also very true. I'm just saying that would that would be absolutely amazing for me, but uh, that that could have been the new Tom Baker era right there. <laughs> could have been Davies and Capaldi, but I still think this is a step in the right direction. I think if anybody can stop the rolling dumpster fire that Doctor Who has become, it's going to be Russell T. Davies. A rolling dumpster fire in the midst of the flood. That's on fire. <laughs> yes. Extinguish me. <laughs> um, because that is what Doctor Who has become. It's become a rolling dumpster fire. That's kind of why we started this podcast. No, it wasn't a rolling. <laughs> it wasn't dumpster a rolling dumpster fire, fire then, but we were seeing the signs, and that's why we started to complain. We it we it had started to deteriorate, and we were annoyed about that. <laughs> it wasn't until. Um, honestly, in my opinion, it wasn't until the last season it became a rolling dumpster fire. <clears throat> it might have been a dumpster fire the year before, but it wasn't rolling. Mm. And then, la the, then last season, somebody kicked it into motion. And if I may, we didn't start the fire. But um, <laughs> if anybody can stop it, it's going to be Russell. Because at least he can try to bring quality back to the show. Uh, he'll bring up standards, which I, has been horribly slipshod in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I that I will enjoy is seeing a better standard. Also, better he seems to have a love of uh, updating good classic monsters for the show, and that would be interesting to see how he does bring any mm -hmm. more new classics in. It would be. Anybody else have anything to say about this? Or have uh, we pretty much covered everything on this? Or have we hammered yeah, this nail in everything. good and tight? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've okay. covered it pretty well. All right. So, moving on, the only other thing we have is Big Finish news. Big and finish. there is one, one, one new release this week, and that is <clears throat> Doctor Who, Missy and the Monk. 
with Michelle Gomez, Rufus Hound, and Gemma Whelan. Or Whelan. <laughs> uh, yes, this is a Missy episode, and yes, this is the uh, Meddling Monk. Oh, a new Meddling Monk. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That's Rufus Hound is their Meddling Monk. So. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I think mm -hmm. the original actor died, so oh, just, well, while Rufus Hound has been the big Finnish monk, yeah. So that is all the news we have. I mean, the Russell T was big, big news. <laughs> and, that, and that took us like a good half hour to talk about. Right. <laughs> yep. Yeah, a smaller so, news story, we would not have talked about that much, but this kind of merited it. There, yeah. yeah, that was that was big freaking honking news. So now we're going to mm. move on to Geek Talk, which people are going to talk about a bunch of old movies, and they're going to talk about <laughs> it quickly. Yes, I'm going to mm. set the timer here quickly. So first things first, yeah. Friday the 13th, part five. Yep. Uh, finally getting around to continuing going through the movies I haven't seen in this franchise. and It's kind of funny because this is the one that I was looking forward to the most. Um, just by virtue of it being the one without Jason in it. <laughs> um, Shame. <laughs> which, you know, is a trend for the two things I'm talking about as far as movies go. Um, it's the, the one without, without the thing the people like? Thing. Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the funny thing. Ultimately, after I was finished, I was like, of the first five, which I've now seen the first six, but I kept the the sixth one off this i'll talk about it next week mm. um especially with how much geek talk we've got at the moment um but yeah like i would say prior to watching six this would have been my favorite of the first five like of this uh, i'm like, sorry first chunk. <laughs> um because like i like one but it hasn't aged incredibly well Two is just more of the same. Three is just more of the same. It feels like four is four is good, um, but that's mainly just because of the addition of Tommy Jarvis. Um, and then you've got this movie, which you know, oh my god, it's not set in a camp, and you Except know, it's there's actually the of the some woods, like where all the camps, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like you know, it's like. Uh, there are actually some likable characters in this, as opposed to just being a bunch of horny teenagers who exist solely to die. Um, well, there's usually and, some you know, likable there teenagers are... there, too. Well, yeah, like, mm. there's some, but usually it's only, <laughs> like, the one as that the series survives. <laughs> as the series goes on and you start rooting for Jason more and more. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah. I generally... I guess I just appreciate the fact that they were trying to take it in a new direction. It's like, well, if we're going to keep this going, we're going to commit to Jason being dead. And, you know, they did that. Like, you know, is this like the best movie ever? No. But I can admire this for what it was <laughs> trying to do. Um, Of course, you know, it's doing pretty well for a movie whose director had only previously done porn, I think, and was coked out of his mind during filming. So <laughs> Jesus, the actors the more are basically why I don't like this movie though. <laughs> yeah, the the actors were basically just acting without direction. Like so good, good. compared to like, you know, you know, like you compare that to uh other movies where the director has just been not all that great with working with actors. The Fan actors are doing stick. a pretty good job. <laughs> Fan four stick. Um, That's how they actually yeah. titled that movie, that Fantastic Four movie. Yep. Uh, that director went completely bonkers and that movie apparently sucks so bad <laughs> that they just literally canceled any more Fantastic Four stuff for like the next 10 years. Hmm. Also, I actually also really like the actor who plays Tommy Jarvis in this, and it I will say, yeah, almost... that's one of the good things about this one. I like their t pick for Tommy. He was not bad pick. Hmm. Of course, it is kind of funny uh, and ironic, given how this ends. That it seems the only reason they recast, according to something I watched, was because this particular actor went off to be a pastor. So, <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> well. That being said, actually, uh, he... I prefer the part six Tommy. To be fair. Because I well, also I guess, know him like, from other movies. Know, he, he, I really do like his actor. He's, yeah. 
I mean, I guess the difference is they're playing up the PTSD a bit less, whereas here he's still very much traumatized. He's it's not that he's uh, not. It's, it's different versions sticks, of traumatization. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's not like in this movie. It's like uh, this one. Laurie's... It's very much like he's like super seriously whacked out and on pills, trying to recover from what happened. Yeah, yeah. Th- this this is very like. Halloween H2O slash Halloween 2018 Laurie Strode levels of PTSD. Mm-hmm. Um uh where he's like he's basically non-verbal for a lot of it. And mm-hmm. he's uh you, you know, like the whole idea is ultimately, you know, spoilers for a movie that let's face it, if you haven't seen it already, you probably didn't care. Um they set up that Tommy is supposed to become the killer moving forward. And it's like, you know well, what? They, they kind of tried to set that up in the, the end of part in four, too. I'm actually yeah. not interested in it for one pure and simple reason. You know what happened to that fake Jason at the end of part five? There's another best spikes waiting for him, too. If they went <laughs> that way. I'm sorry. It just ain't uh, going to work. <laughs> I, I can see why they did. Uh, the original idea with Friday the 13th was a different killer every movie, which is why some of the creators, uh, when they realized it was still Jason by part four, like after two, three, and four, were like, okay, we need to kill this fucker off so that the series can move Mm. on. They killed him off in part four. Part five was supposed to be moving on without him. And then by part six, someone was like, but we need Jason back. Well, it was by part six, it's like, this wasn't working, but it just managed to barely get its money. (laughs) I, I yeah, I was gonna say I forget if five necessarily I forget if it bombed or if it just underperformed. It underperformed so, like, didn't necessarily but didn't bomb. bomb They're like, we can recover yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. So it was like it it performed badly enough whether uh that they were like, Okay, yeah, fuck it. These whiny pricks want Jason back, so I guess we gotta bring him back. So <laughs> So anyways, let's uh, um, let's let's try to end this really quick because we're at six minutes for this mm, now. The box uh, yeah. office uh, was ten times its budget, so Mm. Yeah, mm. but the previous ones did better. Anyway, yeah. Um, well, that's but yeah. In any case, I I would definitely say this is worth uh, <laughs> checking out. Um, and I guess transitioning into the next one, funnily enough, uh, with uh, what Bill brought up, technically both of these franchises were supposed to be anthologies. The that's whole way what through, John Carpenter says when he was talking about writing three, yes, or trying to make three, and um. Seemingly, from what I found out, uh, Halloween 2 was supposed to be the start of that, but then the first movie did so well that the producer backing all of this was like, no, you're doing another one with him. And they were like, okay, so long as we get to do the, the anthology thing, starting with the next one. And then you got this. <laughs> Yeah, um, this is actually. Go ahead. <laughs> and honestly, I like this. Now, did I like this as much as uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part Five? No. No. Um, <laughs> but it's it's not. I don't know. I feel like I, I'll put it this way: Friday Part Five. I got. I like. I was like into it the whole time there was a lot more stuff in halloween 3 that made me like laugh my ass off in a like where the hell is this even going kind of a way <laughs> um yeah halloween 3 is so bad it's good kind of a deal which is not what oh, i want yeah, on my like, halloween I, I definitely, as a, as a I halloween fan that's not what it. i want <laughs> yeah of course i do find it funny that um the main guy is it tom atkins yeah um that there's like a point where him and like the daughter of this uh, guy who dies really early are trying to find out more about what's going on and like they pose as a married couple and I'm like, dude, mm-hmm. he's young enough to be your daughter. I mean, you might have been better off like posing as that mm-hmm. rather than I don't think he trying was to claim that old. a married couple. And I don't think she was think- that young either, but Maybe she was. She was, The actress was legit. I, I don't know how old she was supposed to be playing, but the actress was young enough. There was enough of an age gap. She was like in her twenties, 
but there was enough of an age gap between the two that he could legitimately be her dad. So <laughs> that, that's the film industry for you. Yeah, that's why it's like, yeah, mm. not really surprising. I mean, Roger Moore's was like in his fifties by the end of his Bond run, and he was still getting, um, w- getting like Bond girls that were old enough that like well young enough by mm. comparison that there's enough of an age gap it's like yeah even, out, even outside of movies i know actors in their 50s that are dating girls that are young enough that i wouldn't look at them in, a, in that way yeah um but yeah it's like you know and the ending is interesting because i either forgot or just didn't realize that it was essentially left like oh do all of the kids in the United States die or not? Um, you know, because <laughs> that's what's at stake ultimately. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, not all, but all the kids that actually bought one of these silver shamrock masks. All the which kids that bought the funny. masks and to have them to turn to that channel, yeah. Yeah, because once I watched a thing about it, like I like the jingle, but apparently oh. there are plenty of people who get annoyed to shit by it, and it's like, oh, hey, I'll take this over. Shamrock. Yeah, oh, like, God, I, I, I will take oh, the silver shamrock jingle I, like the video i was watching where the where a guy constantly complained about the jingle um as he's reviewing the movie the more i'm like dude i've had to i've had to sit through the last chance to learn <laughs> i will take silver shamrock over that. i don't know i don't know much. that's that's a close call man <laughs> that's a close call that cuts Uh-oh. into my soul yeah, honestly, if, if you can, and like, again, this was one of those things where, like, I was really interested in seeing it by virtue of the fact that it has nothing to do with anything else. It's like, is it as bad as people were making it out to be? Uh, no, I wouldn't also necessarily call it, like, you know, like an underrated classic or anything. Cult classic status. I wouldn't even. I wouldn't this. honestly. Maybe a cult um, classic for people who really like horrible movies, but <laughs> but um, I have to say, as a fan of the Halloween franchise, mm. I tried giving three a fair shake, and it makes me just yeah. <laughs> um, I'll put it this way: it is not the worst Halloween movie, <laughs> <laughs> at least of the ones I've seen so far. That is probably still Resurrection um Ooh, but yeah that's yeah. pretty high up there on the shit list have um, you seen curse uh not yet <laughs> that's also uh, basically, a mess <laughs> at this po- at this point the only ones i haven't seen are four five and six um four and five are okay six is a bloody mess although the michael myers the the non-plot wise the michael myers stuff is good but Plot wise, mm. yeah, six is a hot mess. I'm definitely not looking forward to the deteriorating quality of the mask, <laughs> <clears throat> uh, which doesn't seem to get better until like the new stuff being made right now. And honestly, as much as people rag on the the Rob Zombie movies, at least the mask in that was good. So, <laughs> uh, um, at least the in person yeah. versions I've seen of it are absolute garbage. <laughs> I've actually been in person to see the newest one, and that actually still looks really effective. So, mm. Mm. Uh, but yeah, in any case, it, I, I would, yeah, but in any case, I would say it's worth uh, checking out as well, just to, for the sheer, like, what the fuckery of the fact that this is like the only <laughs> Halloween movie that has nothing to do um, with mm. Michael Myers. With, with, yeah, it's, it's, it's still Michael interesting. Myers. Uh, for morbid curiosity. Oh, uh, a really quick interesting fact before we move on to Batman. Uh, those three masks that were made in this movie, the molds are made in such a way that they are still producing those masks, and those masks <laughs> do appear in the newest Halloween movie that came out in mm. 2019. And seemingly, based on the trailers, will be in the next one as well. Jeez, they're using them again? <laughs> Mm. <laughs> that, that the reference for three just will not go away. There's just always that background <laughs> reference. It seems every once in a while, mm. even if it's not canon. <laughs> <laughs> Ad- admittedly, I want that skull mask. Anyway, so moving on. Yep, okay. Batman. Yes, so Batman 1966. I realized as I was looking at my list of DC movies that I had cribbed off of, I think Wikipedia. Ah, uh, that Batman, the uh, 1966 movie was not on there. 
Um, that movie was also not on HBO, but I searched on my Roku and realized I could watch it through Spectrum On Demand. Uh, so I did. Uh, and it was very interesting. And I think watching it right after Superman 3 was kind of <laughs> almost a good fit. Because Superman 3 was pretty much a comedy movie featuring Superman as a side character. And Batman 1966 is, uh, well, it's... Uh, it's, it's definitely more comedy than action drama. It is Silver Age camp. Yes. It's very hard to even try to judge it based on modern superhero standards. Mm -hmm. um, it predates the modern superhero movie. Um, it's By at it's, least uh, it's almost a decade and a half. Right. Um, it's probably better than the 50s serials uh, of Batman, which were just incredibly racist, among other things. Um, has anybody here watched the series of Batman 66? I've seen you some bits the, of it. The Batman TV series? I've seen a good yeah. chunk of it. I'm assuming that show is episodic, right? Not serialized? It's you, it's, um, kind of both. Okay. It's a little bit it, both, yeah. It's usually a two-part story. Mm -hmm. Okay. With, um, with, with cliffhangers and surprise survivals? Uh-huh. Yep. And then it moves on to another, and then each... Each episode ends with a with a uh, cold open for the next one. Okay, um, and then the but the other one does they but there's not much continuity between them unless of course a villain returns. In right. which case they may or may not reference the last time they showed up. Yeah. So the the reason I asked about that is that this uh, is basically structured as a basically four episodes each with a cliffhanger in between as a, sort of like a four-part story. So it sounds like it's basically a double-length story, and it makes sense that the Batman story with four villains that keeps harping on about there being four of them is a is basically a four-part story. Uh, again, it's hard to judge the action or the plot based on modern things. If we were to hold it to the same standards as something like Superman, we'd probably say it's trash. But it's not meant to fill the same roles. It's meant to be more uh, jokey. Um, it's well known for basically being written as completely comedic. And then the actors are told to play it completely straight. And I do think they do a mm -hmm. pretty good job of that. Oh, yeah. Um, it's it's disappointing that Eartha Kitt was not Batwoman in here. Uh, but I guess or, she you would... You mean Catwoman, yeah. Is that not what I said? You, you said, said Batwoman. Batwoman. Oh, I meant to say Catwoman. <laughs> However, she would have had more trouble playing a Russian than the actress who is playing her here. Uh, I don't think Mary Weather. A, mm -hmm. I don't think that's why. I think she had already been recast, but that was definitely a benefit there. It's, it, with one of those things, it's usually when an actress was committed to another project. Mm. Or simply didn't want to come back, they would just recast it. Yeah, yeah I, I think Catwoman um, was like recast like two or three times. My understanding is it was mm. Eartha Kit in the beginning, and then she was recast mm. later in the show. Yes, it um, things get kept changing. Um, in this particular movie, for instance, Frank Gorshin is the Riddler, and that was true also for season one and three of Batman. But he was unavailable for when they uh, made season two Batman. So um, he was replaced um, by, um, oh, God, what was his name? Um, oh, the no. guy that played Gomez Adams. Oh. Um, um, Raul oh. Julia or a different Gomez? No, 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 no early. Um, the, the 60s, like. I'm, I'm taking Adam the wrong, okay, I'm, I'm, okay. I, I don't know. Or was it fifties? Uh, I can't remember. But anyways, uh, the earlier M's family no, show, 60s, the, the black uh, and white show. Yep. Um, I, I can't Aston. think of his name, but he's still around, isn't he? No, I, I, I think he's, I think he's done. Uh, um, uh, I think uh, John Aston. Ah. Uh, hmm. Yep, John Aston um, was was and is was apparently basically... still kicking. Yes, like I said, he's oh, still he around. <laughs> Ninety-one. But, um, one but, thing that yeah. really. Sorry, go ahead. Go finish what you're saying. Uh, but that was simply a fact that one actor was unavailable. Mm -hmm. uh, Catwoman got replaced like two, three times over the course of the series. Oh, yeah. I didn't know it was that frequently. I knew there oh, were yeah. at least two actresses. Okay. No, three at least. Okay. Um. Oh, yeah. So uh, one thing I found really surprising 
uh, was that uh, they they through various times they have various uh, leaders. Um, Penguin talks about he's you know being the leader at sea, which I guess makes some sense. Um, and otherwise, Catwoman seems to be the leader, uh, which is interesting considering she's usually um, at least in modern day. She's usually less of the supervillain and more of the kind of anti-villain, anti-hero role. Um, uh, by by the way, Catwoman mm-hmm. in the early, uh, was played by Lee Merriweather in the movie, which actually happened between seasons one, between seasons two and three. Okay. Um, the uh, original was played by Julie Newmar for seasons one or two. Lee, oh. Lee Merriweather for the movie, and then was replaced by Eartha Kitt for only season three. Oh, Eartha Kitt was after the movie. I th- did not realize that. I thought she was before the movie. Okay. Um, but like I was saying, I was really surprised that Cesar Romero's Joker um, pretty much, I mean, other than he's pretty much there to um, make a few puns about jokes. Um, and that's mostly about it, uh, which I imagine is partially because during the Silver Age, it was probably a lot harder to do a meaningful Joker story compared to the Golden Age or the Bronze Age when he could actually kill people. Yeah. That being said, yeah, he also he was... was one of the guys that set up the most traps too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He would he would, he would gags. Do, yeah, he would he would snare he would snare them, but yeah, they had to tone down the homicidal tendencies. Mm-hmm. Just uh, a little. <laughs> uh for uh because of issues at the time. Yeah. And um it wasn't until Batman eighty nine that we got the Joker back. Well, he got he came back earlier in the comic books too. Eighties Joker was pretty hardcore, mm-hmm. um, like you know, killing Robin, um, yeah, Red Hood, killing and all that. Joke, yeah. that kind of shit. And, yeah, but we didn't get to see that on a screen until the eighty nine Batman, where it was Jack Nicholson, mm-hmm. and then he had to be toned down again slightly for the animated series, but he was still pretty freaking frightening in that. Yeah. Mm. Um. The Joker actually, I think, got less play in this than the Riddler, who the Riddler's main job there was to kind of give Batman just enough information that he could eventually win. Um, but at least, you know, they were riddles. And uh, I I would hesitate to call some of Joker's jokes in this jokes because they just weren't up to snuff a lot <laughs> of the time. Um, oh, come but, on, yeah. come on. Tell me you didn't spend half the time the Joker was on the screen staring at his mustache. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so this is definitely a, a uh, an interesting curiosity and something to look at if you're interested in superhero history, film history, things like that. Uh, I know that this show and this movie inspired a deep-seated hatred of goofy superheroes in people who would go on to produce future Batman movies um, that have come to pass and including Batman 89, I believe. Um, So if you're, so I I definitely, um, if you're not interested in comedic takes on superheroes, don't watch this at all. Um, But yeah, I'm, I still have trouble gauging how I really feel about it. Uh, I don't regret watching it, but it's not a movie that I would just recommend to the majority of people. Yeah, it, it's, it's fun, but don't it, expect seriousness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really mm-hmm. part of that '60s Batman camp vibe. Mm-hmm. If you like watching stuff like Lost in Space and <laughs> that kind of era show, this is pretty much the thing that created that kind of campy TV series. Oh, that's right. I, I forgot one note before I finish off. I was surprised it did not have the you know like the 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 sound slash visual effects during the fights that you associate with the show, the bang, pow, et cetera, um, that's you, that's supposed to be used to kind of like dull down the violence. I was surprised at that. Um, and I think it could have used it because you can really see how, uh, Adam West was really pulling his punches to not hurt the henchmen (laughs) or otherwise just like, it wasn't choreographed in a way that they, that they looked like they were fighting. You mean, um, mean that I think, you saw a version that never did that? I don't think it ever did that. Because it did it for sure in the last action sequence on the fight on the submarine. 
on the submarine. Yeah, when the submarine surfaced remember. and they start having a melee fight where everyone starts getting knocked into the water. I don't remember that, but the, I mainly remember Shame. making this observation when um, when Batman and Catwoman were about to fuck, and then the fight happened. Oh, that was like not even a real fight. That was a we trapped you. Well, I mean, they, they it was a real fight in that uh, Bruce was trying not to be captured, and he was. Yeah, the, the Bill, that wouldn't happen during that particular sequence. The thing when that happens, Bill, is usually the big epic fight at the end of the storyline. So it wasn't every fight. It was no, it was during... not every okay. fight. Okay, that makes sense. That's then. probably why you probably weren't noticing the fight happening that that submarine because you can't even remember that fight. <laughs> That's when you should have been paying the attention the most, <laughs> and you would have gotten I all will... the sound effects. <laughs> I will remind you, though, for like 20 years after this, this was Batman to people. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's move on. Kapow. Yeah. Uh, over the past, like, three streams uh, that I've been doing, I decided, eh, why the hell not? And uh, played through uh, the... PS4 remaster of uh, Grim Fandango. Um, I had no idea what this game was really about <laughs> going into it. Um, I mean, like, I feel like I wasn't too uh, taken aback by, like, the noir-type feel to it. Um, I feel like I had some inclination that that was a thing. Um... But yeah, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking this might be the first LucasArts game like this that I've played. I mean, I know I haven't played any of the Monkey Island games, so those are more point and click, I think. Um, well, that's what Grim Fandango is. It's just a more modernized take on it. Yeah. Um, this is like the first at least the LucasArts style of adventure game anyway that I've played um of this kind of game um and yeah like I actually I really liked it it's not too much to say I guess I mean the funny thing is I the game was actually a lot shorter than I thought it would be because <laughs> like uh with how long the uh first two chapters took me because I was trying to mostly do it without a walkthrough um, but then I would just get too annoyed and be and too like impatient <laughs> about certain things that I'm like, certain things were easy enough to figure out, but then there were some things where it's like, you know, there were some things in like the last stream I think I did where I'm like, there is no way in hell I would have figured out to do that. <laughs> That's um, a, that is a telltale sign of uh, point and click games, at least old ones. <laughs> yeah. Um, because it's like, you know, get this character to vomit and then, you know, uh, douse the vomit in liquid nitrogen. It's like, I wouldn't have fucking thought to do that. <laughs> Grab the paper star like 10 rooms ago and throw it at the Wavering because it's going to turn into a sudden freaking meteor and blow the Wavering to, wave to pieces so you can grab the talisman. Wait, how am I supposed <laughs> to know this? <coughs> um, Somebody's been playing Shadowgate again. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Um, yeah, I mean, it's generally also very interesting because it's uh, the whole aesthetic and setting is based on the um, uh, Land of the Dead relating to the uh, Mexican Day of the Dead mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Um, so that's a really interesting aesthetic choice. I mean, it is funny that there are like, you can tell. Uh, you know, it's funny because there's like, there's at one point where there's a character that you've got to do something with named Naranjo or Naran. Uh, yeah, Naran. It's like, I swear to God, it's pronounced like three different ways. There's like, what I assumed was the correct one because I thought I'm pretty sure I'd heard the name before, and that was Naranjo. And then there was another person that calls him Naran Naranjo, I think. 
and another that says Naran Joe. And I'm like, well, Naran Joe is wrong because <laughs> this is a Spanish name and thus yep. the H, the J would not be pronounced as a J. For, for context, the Spanish word Naranjo is the word for orange tree. Ah. Um, but yeah, it's like, there's yeah, there's at least three, maybe just two pronunciations of it. And it's like, I was taken aback by one character pronouncing it wrong, and then the main character who is either voiced by someone who actually has Spanish as a language, whether it be because they are of Latino heritage, or, I don't know, maybe they just learned the language, or they were affecting the accent and decided, well, I should actually pronounce this correctly. <laughs> um, but they actually, like, immediately afterwards, after I was like, wait, I'm pretty sure it's not pronounced that way, they pronounce it correctly, so I was like, oh. <laughs> okay, so it's just this one voice actor playing a, a stereotypical uh, crusty old sailor type guy that's not pronouncing it correctly and there's like maybe one or two other characters that don't and i'm like well, this is a bit inconsistent um but in any case like the settings are fun um and yeah like it really is like let's see the streams i did there was like two streams that were like a bit over three hours and the last one was just under four hours so all in all, it did not take me a very long time to do this. So if if you're someone who hasn't checked it out before, I mean, the remaster is available on, and maybe even the original game anyway, it's probably available on Steam or something. I know the remaster. Steam and GOG. Is. Yeah. And there, again, like I played it on uh, the PS4 remaster, which came out in 2015. The weird thing to me, like, I wasn't surprised that the Switch one didn't come out until 2018, given that the Switch only came out in 2017. But what I was surprised to learn is that the Xbox One version of the remaster came out last year. Hmm. Which is weird, um, unless there was some sort of thing, deal made, where it couldn't go onto that console and for I'm, a certain amount of time yeah i don't I know maybe, maybe there was some sort of console deal or something i don't know yeah um but yeah that like you know again like the switch taking a bit longer was like well okay the switch came out later but even then that was really bizarre to me to, to learn but in any case yeah i think it it's it's worth checking out it's not too long so if you are looking for a shorter game um and a game made and like essentially a, a remaster of a game that was made in the late nineties. Um, you know, I would say this is pretty good and definitely worth checking out. Yep. Uh, also closing note, I would add that a lot of, uh, PC nineties games like this, uh, are kind of dead. Mostly due to the fact that <laughs> a lot of them are really hard to get running again. So yeah, remaster is almost needed. Hmm. Uh, they also did a remaster of uh, Full Throttle, which is also a LucasArts uh, game. Eh. And I would recommend I've managed to play through it. The only time I really got stuck really badly was right near the end. Mm. But anyway. Uh, so that's the end of Geek Talk. So, episode. Yep. Wait, what? Huh? Sorry? End of Geek Talk. I, 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 I lost you guys. I I I just got distracted. <laughs> uh huh. Episode summary. <sighs> All right. Uh, give me just a second here. I'll run through it in my head. Okay. I'm ready. All right. Starting in three, two, one, go. Okay, so Jack and Tosh go to investigate a old um, club somewhere in Cardiff that uh, people keep hear, uh, basically hearing music coming through. So they're suspecting a haunting. They go through in, they go from one side to the other, hear nothing until they get past the main ballroom. And then they start hearing music coming from where they just left. Going back, 
they find themselves in what looks to be a ball. And uh, Jack is surprised because the people there are actually real. They're not manifestations or anything. Um, they run into some people. Uh, they uh, go outside and they can't find their SUV. And it says that it's 1941. So they've suddenly gone back in time. Meanwhile, um, Ianto's trying to contact Tosh, fails. They send out uh, Gwen to investigate further, and she's searching around the place. Owen wakes up and is gets a little obsessed when he takes a look at the notes and realizes that uh, Tosh has been monitoring rift activity and basically has the time event that uh, Diane, from two episodes previously, had gone and entered the rift in her plane at after basically ditching him. Um, back at the party, uh, Tosh is eventually accosted by some guy, and uh, Jack goes to break that up and gets in a fight with a man, but it's broken up by somebody else who introduces himself as Captain Jack Harkness. Uh, this makes things a little awkward for a moment until Jack thinks up a quick suit at him and uh, basically starts uh, talking about things. Tosh is, of course, confused, but realizes also when she gets back down to business that she has half the equation they need to get back. The other half is in the hub. The hub, meanwhile... Yanto and um, Owen realize the same thing, and Owen wants to use the uh, big rift manipulator to just throw the rift open in hopes of getting them home. Yanto's against this because he correctly realized, thinks that that might also get Diane back from the rift. So, uh, basically, Tosh develops a way to uh, finish the formula and hide it in various locations around there, which starts a scavenger hunt in modern times with Owen not being able to start the rift manipulator because it's missing a part. He joins the scavenger hunt until he finds it and goes back to the hub. But it still not, doesn't quite work, so eventually he ha breaks into Jack's office and looks through his stuff and finds the uh, blueprints for the manipulator. Uh, this basically builds to a head as uh, eventually Ianto turns a gun on Owen and winds up actually shooting him, but not before Owen actually activates the rift. Meanwhile, Jack and Tosh, Jack has been talking to Jack and seems to try to develop some rapport. He knows the fact that this Jack Harkness is going to die the next day um, and is trying to get him to live his life to, his, to the fullest. And somewhere along the way, the two become attracted to each other. Um, meanwhile, Tasha, both Tosh and Gwen have been accosted by the manager or caretaker of the area, whose name is Billis Manger. Um, they seem to think that Billis Manger may be actively working against him as he appears the same age in both times. That of being older than dirt. Um Eventually, when Owen does activate the rift, um, Jack and Gwen or uh, Jack has to say goodbye to Jack. And first, they're about to walk off, but then they uh, have a little dance together and share a rather passionate kiss before Jack leaves for his own time. Also, at the same point, Billis Manger smiles in triumph with what happens. Everybody gets back, but there's still some bad feelings going on at the end of the episode. The end. You did it. In four minutes, 48 seconds. Just under time. <laughs> God damn, when I saw there were three different storylines going on, I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Give me and, the goddamn complex one, why don't you? And yeah, and it certainly seems like certain people uh, weren't able to be on set at the same time as each other. Oh, doesn't gee, help. You think? <laughs> it's okay. like oh, interesting how Owen and Gwen never seem to actually make eye contact when they're both at the same place. Yes. So, 
Let's talk about what we liked about the episode. And Thomas, you're first. Um, <coughs> I guess I just kind of like the the concept of seeing the that location in two different eras, like back during the Blitz and current day of like they're both in this. They're in the same location, but by virtue of the fuckery going on, um, you know, obviously can't actually interact, but there's little bits and pieces coming through that Gwen almost sees and stuff like that. That's like one will yell, the other side will hear, mm. but never actually see. There's also a very yeah. quick moment here or there where like Gwen hears dancers and immediately turns to see nobody. Mm-hmm. Mm. Or you'll see motion and then Gwen looks and nothing's there. Mm-hmm. It yeah. does. It does give it a feel like a haunting. Mm. If this was a bigger place, you could almost say sh the shining, but. <laughs> All right. Yeah, not quite. <laughs> not quite. Matt, how about you? Uh, general thing I liked about this story. Um, this is the first time we've seen the older air quotes gentleman, correct? Uh, the... Billis Manger? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We we have reviewed the episode that comes after this, but this yeah, is we've the first reviewed time the episodes he where he appears that come after this. Yeah, it was. He definitely has a very interesting setup for a possible villain, and he apparently does have some sort of tie to Torchwood because he has paperwork from like the 1940s. Oh, remember Torchwood has been around since the 1870s. Yeah. So he again, so he has some sort of weird tie-in somehow with all this. So it's interesting to see where he kind of goes from here. Um, although I think it might be more interesting to see what Big Finch does with him because after they have their season finale, they kind of drop him. Yep. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So, Bill? I like that this episode managed to dig more into Jack's backstory without completely removing the mystery. Mm -hmm. uh, so we learn, um, we you know, we learn that his name is something that came about after he was a time agent. Although I don't think anyone in Torchwood knows he was a time agent. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, uh, which actually, I'm not sure if this means that he first got the name in the same visit to World War II that he met Rose, or if it, that had, he had already been there multiple times by then. Um, but that's. Like I said, it doesn't completely remove the mystery, but it's still, you know, we still get to learn a little bit more about him. We learn that he never actually met the man. We learn what era the name is from, etc. So I thought that was really cool. All right. So I like is that after mostly being a background character, Toshiko actually had um, some like major roles in this episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's true. And actually, yeah, we just talked about that last week. Yep. <laughs> we were talking about, yeah, it didn't seem that Tosh had anything. I had forgotten that she had such a large role in this episode. Mm. And she was, I mean, because Jack was busy meeting and greeting Jack. So he wasn't really <laughs> focusing. It was all Tosh in 41. Yeah, she was doing all the problem solving. She was doing all the problem solving yeah. while Jack was basically doing cover for her. Well, Jack was being Jack. Well, he was also being Jack at the same time, but he was still doing cover so she mm -hmm. could get around and do what she needed to do. Yeah, his 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 knowledge of the era did help her out a little bit, uh, but he was mostly focused on solving Jack's problems, meaning the other Jack, mm -hmm. as <laughs> as much as he was their own. Mm. Okay, so what did we not like about this episode? Do we need to say it? Let's go ahead, Thomas. <laughs> um, God, let's see. Can I narrow it down? Um, um, God, you know, I'm going to have to pass because it's like, it's not even that I can't think of anything. It's more how to articulate is like my brain's just not. 
So so um, you might so we might come back to you if you come up with it. Yeah. Okay. Matt. Owen is a bloody imbecile. Yes. Why is he second in command? Yeah, I when was know. that a thing? I, I guess he has seniority, cause... but yeah, that's basically it. It's basically by mm. who did Jack hire next? And it was Jack Owen. Oh, actually, I think it was what? What's her face? Jack, Susie, then mm -hmm. Owen, um, then, then Tosh, Tosh, Yanto, Gwen, uh, Tosh, Gwen, Yanto, actually, because didn't Yanto show up like at the end of the first episode? And then actually, Yanto I, showed up like already in the early, like midway uh, through the first episode, so he was already there. Yeah, because we um when we see a flashback, it's basically he uh, he approached Jack right after the Battle of Canary Wharf, and Jack okay, almost it's, didn't it's hire him. It's been a while since I've seen that. Yeah. Uh, but I think Cyber Women Cyber Woman really suggests that Yanto is almost as new <clears throat> as Gwen, at least at the Cardiff location. Yeah, but um, and then of course you know Susie of course was killed, so that provokes mm. Owen to second in command. Mm -hmm. by seniority. Unfortunately, that doesn't help the fact that Owen is a dick. Yep. <laughs> and he's pretty much the entire episode going, what about Owen? And he he seems to be making all his decisions based with that particular organ. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. he does. I want my shag back. Give me my shag back. Not, not to mention, <laughs> she specifically wanted to leave, so him bringing her back would not get him on her good side. Yeah, he, he's not thinking. And Thank you, you would think, you know, smash. he would have been at least experienced enough to think, okay, yeah, I'm going to be a miserable ass, but there's nothing I can do to bring her back. Nope. Mm. Yeah, Owen's a fucking prick. And this and just fun... makes us like him less. Yeah, I mean, like, the funny thing is, is that because of the nature of the franchise this is involved with, you could easily have it that be like, like a revelation that some, someone or some entity has been like, oh, you know, if you open it, I can bring it back to you. But, you know, I mean, like, given the shit that kind of goes on with this, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like, the mysterious dude who seems to run that building. Um, you know, if there was some sort of interaction between them, even if brief, that made it seem like uh, they were sort of in cahoots or something, or like Owen already knew about this or whatever, then like that could maybe have worked. I mean, you know, it wouldn't make not one any less likable, but at least it would have been a matter of he was being manipulated. <laughs> and that, that actually could work because he he goes to Billis's office. I don't think they ever meet. No, um, they don't. but mm. he goes to Billis's because I think Billis was in 1941 at the time. But um, he goes mm. to Billis's office, and that would have really worked because in the following episode, um, he seems to like be like I think he's telepathically manipulating Gwen. To be like, oh, mm. you know, you can fix all these problems if you open the rift. So if he did that in person with Owen first, or even if they just like had, if you see that they met and had a conversation, but you don't know what about, um, that mm. could that could have been really good foreshadowing for the following episode. Yeah. So, what's the name of that episode again? Which one? The one after this. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you just a moment. It is... Oh, yeah, it's, we have a chart. Yes, we have a chart, so it's everything. Everything started. It's end of days. End of day. So, yes. All okay, we were, we were all here when we reviewed that. That's what I wanted to check on. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, Bill, what is it that you don't like? Uh, other than Owen, what I do not like is it seemed like they did a lot of work in the beginning, probably because someone asked a question in the writer's room to establish like they have that really awkward scene of like, oh, did the audience members, do you remember that Toshiko is Japanese? 
Uh, mm-hmm. Oh, damn it. That was what I was going to say. And, and you like, there are a few scenes related to that very early on, and then it just vanishes. No one cares anymore after the, like, oh, she's a decoder. Bam. That solves the whole plot. Nobody, there's no more racist people in the, uh, in the allies. Uh, everybody's fine. And she's just focused on the, you know, nobody's trying to stop her other than Billis. Um, and it seemed like that was a plot that could have added believable drama to uh, the story. And it didn't. Which mm. which makes the, by the way, do you remember that she's Japanese scene at the very beginning even more awkward? Mm-hmm. Mm. I it mean, was... it seems to, seems to be a thing in well like it's funny because i could almost excuse it more in doctor who because doctor who is aimed at a broader audience but you would think in the adults focus spin-off that there'd be a bit more you know conflict around whoops we're in a time period where i'm not you know like i'm not anywhere near as safe as i am in modern day so whoops granted they do make it clear it's like well, shit, it's lucky this is, like, months before Pearl Harbor, because otherwise I would be absolutely fucked. But yeah, it comes up twice and never again. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, I thought maybe that person who was like, oh, why is he dancing with a Jap would, like, cause some major thing, but I think maybe she, she, uh, she might, like, speak one more time about it, and then that's about it. Yeah, yeah, I that. think it's like she confronts. I think it's the same woman confronts it later, but that's when they bring up the Dakota thing. I think. Yeah. Um. And like after that, everyone just leaves her alone. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I forgot at first that that lady was in that scene, but that that was that was the the payoff to that moment, and that wasn't enough of a payoff. Yeah. Especially yeah. since it was a chance for an escalation. Like she's carrying around a laptop that she can't explain. They need to make up an excuse mm. that they could have disproven, and then nothing happens. Yeah. All right, I have to pass because Bill stole mine, <laughs> and Matt, Matt stole my other one. I was gonna say Matt, Matt stole mine, so I stole yours. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I had a primary and a backup, and the two of you took both of them. So there, there's one four-letter <laughs> word in most Torchwood reviews, and it starts with an O. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to favorite scenes. Thomas. Hmm. Um. God, let's see. Um. Wow! It really shows that this episode did not hold my attention as much because <laughs> I'm just wow. trying to yeah you're this um, is the second time think, you're or at least I got a lot more easily distracted this time mm. than I would normally um I, let's I've had see. weeks like that where I'm reviewing the episode and I'm just like I must have been tired when I watched it because I don't remember any details um I would say um God let's see. Hmm. I mean, me being me, you'd think there'd be a scene that I would easily go for, but that's actually going to come up later. But let's see. Um. Honestly, like, you know, as much as it doesn't go anywhere, I do like the frank discussion about um the persecution that Toshiko's granddad, I think it was specifically, had to put up with. Yeah. And all that, because it was nice, because the most we ever get in, like, Doctor Who, usually, is, you know, uh, with both Bill and Martha being, like, pointing out their skin tone, and being, like, you know, um, you know, it's like, I'm not, you know, (laughs) I don't exactly blend in, kind of a thing, and that's about as far as it goes. I mean, we get, we get a, we get a bit of it with, um, Yaz and Ryan Mm -hmm. in the Rosa episode, but like, I was going to say, since we were comparing RTV and Chibnall er er earlier, 
Um, the equivalent of the equivalent of this ep- episode in the modern day would have been Rozo or Demons of the Punjab. Mm. Or at least of that. Maybe not the whole episode, but at least of the yeah, scene. Yeah, yeah. All right, Matt. Um, a favorite scene I think we'll have to go to uh, the two Jacks talking. Um, um, mostly uh, getting them starting to involve men, uh, the uh, the men they're working with, etc., and uh, how they're supposed to be perceived. And uh, Jack finally opens up a little more about uh, some of his backstory as well about apparently losing a friend. Due to battle, etc. Okay. That um, supposedly that's where he might have started going down the path he went down. Mm-hmm. I think they actually will bring that up later in Torchwood, but I'm not sure. Bill, maybe. Um. So, uh, what I liked was the scene where basically Gwen and Tosh are more or less in the exact same place. Um, but separated across decades, and Gwen is calling Tosh and Jack, and they kind of alternate. One thinks they hear her, and then the other thinks they hear her, um, but they never quite piece together what's going on. I thought that was really well shot and uh, acted. Uh-huh. That was a good That was a good moment. Um, my favorite scene was the one where Jack is sitting there in abject frustration because, you know, it's like, I know he's going to die tomorrow, I can fix this, I can fix this other thing, but I can't do anything about that. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, it's one of those situations we've seen the doctor under a few times. And it's nice to see somebody else have mm-hmm. that same issue. It's Jack's Volcano Day. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's talk about least favorite scenes. Now, you would think with me this would have been my uh, favorite, but no, because I'm queer this was annoying because it looked like uh specifically uh the kiss between jack and jack because it looked i mean john barrowman is you know legitimately into men so of course he's going to be fine kissing another guy but it to me it did not look like the other actor was committed (laughs) no to the kiss um it would look very awkward and ve- like on his end like barman's going for it but this other guy either looks just i you know, like you know if it was like uncomfortable at first because he's doing this in front of other people so it's in character thing fine but like with the moment and everything, the kiss just looks ultimately really awkward on that guy's half because he looks like he does not want any part of it. And it's like, oh, Christ. There are plenty of straight actors that have just gone all in on a kiss with another man before. So I don't know if it was just this particular guy as a hang-up or, I don't know, maybe, like, whatever. But it's just like, it was like, well, that kind of ruined the moment. <laughs> <laughs> looks like uh, yeah the other I, I can't, no I can't part put of my it, thumb in on it if it's the just one of them was a little too into it or the other one was just too not into it but there was definitely something that felt awkward about it uh-huh. mm. it was a good idea but it didn't quite pass i will be yeah. talking about that scene too in mine but i'll let everyone else go because mm. i have i have issues with it from a completely different angle i guess when he acted in shakespeare it was uh, a little too much in the modern day to get used to kissing uh, men. <laughs> I can't find anything about the actor's personal life, but. Mm-hmm. Yep. I can't either. Um. Anyway, Matt, your least favorite scene. Um. What was it? Actually, oh, um, least favorite scene. Oh, I'm going through what's his face's place, trying to find stuff. It. Not only does it feel like he's running around in there making too much dang noise, the guy's supposed to be lurking about. Because I'm not sure how he goes through time, if he actually does do go through time linearly, or if he's somehow phasing in and out through through time because of the rift. But Owen is just being really too ham-fisted and making a mess of things. 
for someone who's supposed to be sneaking around looking for a film reload. And, and um, Owen doesn't know that he's in 1941. Yeah, honestly. But, but still, uh, yeah. The, the subtitles of that is the fact that uh, Billis Manger was allowing Owen to do this. Because mm-hmm. he yes. wanted mm-hmm. Owen to find the, the, the little cog thing. Yeah, that's my thought too, is that even if he is literally still there in that time... He's allowing Owen to go do the search, but at the same time, Owen's supposed to be sneaky about it. Yeah. Instead Which, again, of this like, weird Owen, creepy guy that Owen obviously has some sort of time like station, no, that he's there. Fix. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And as we were discussing before, if like if if Owen was just in on this and had that would also yeah if he, if yeah, or if they would have changed that scene to make him sense. in on it, then it would make more sense too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Bill, your least favorite scene. So, I am going to go with uh, Gwen finding the photograph, just because it seemed completely ludicrous to me that the method that Tosh used to hide that would have been so easy to find it, you know, uh, what, 60 years and a war later. In the without same corner. anything being disturbed, without uh, whatever that thing pointing at, at it on the ground was, it looked like a badge, um, without that being disturbed or buried or anything, you know, <laughs> I guess there was no weather there for 60 years. Um, no dust. I'm, I'm guessing we can probably say, oh, Billis wanted them to find just the right amount of clues um, so that they would open the rift, but... Taking, you know, looking at it from any other point of view, it's just that should not have worked. They should have been stuck. Mm. Yeah, that that one was a little findy because that was like some kind of maintenance locker. And you can't tell me that somebody wouldn't have gone in there sometime like, like in the some last. Like some sort of electro box right. even, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, sometime in the last 60, 70 years, yeah. Yeah. Like, like if uh, five like years if... even, 10 years, I would believe, because I've seen... I've seen maintenance uh, closets that weren't touched in ten years, but sixty. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, like, yeah. That that's was... that's the thing of like having uh, Billis show up like a couple more times to make it clear that he's sort of like not even necessarily show him directly trying to fuck with stuff so it will stick around, but just like making it clear that he's. Sh- you know, following them around is aware of it. You could at least hand wave it to be like, oh, well, you know, clearly he wants them to succeed to some degree. Yeah, like, not even um, necessarily showing him putting the stuff in where they find it, but just like have him like mm. maybe peek around a corner and smile a little bit because he's very good at that, at the ending. <laughs> so, was that Bill's? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, again, my least favorite scene is the same as Thomas's, the kiss at the end. But mine, my issue with it is focused on the crowd reaction. Because, um, yes, they're they're watching in shock, first of all, as Jack and Jack dance. And there's some comments at the beginning, what are they doing, what are they doing? And then the crowd just seems to freeze as if somebody hit pause on them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And then they proceed to dance a little while longer. Jack walks to the rift, walks back, kisses him. The crowd never moves at all. Hmm. And my problem with this is this is actually 1941. And yeah. these are military people who are usually conservative and rather aggressive. <laughs> Somebody would have made a comment. Mm hmm. It wouldn't have been a nice comment. Mm. And instead, it's just like, no, they're done. Considering that even even the bare minimum of what might have happened. They made a they made a comment about uh, his uh, his uh, one of his men dancing with a Japanese woman, and that was a straight dance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly, there are two guys dancing, mm -hmm. and yes, they're obviously shocked. There should have been a freaking fight breakout. I, I, I was gonna. I, mm. I could kind of see, um, especially if he's one of the highest, one of or the highest ranking 
officer there that they might not be quite to the point of being willing or confident laying a hand on him. But there would definitely have been There'd feelings, be... if nothing else. Yeah, yeah. You, you would have seen more whispering and talking between all the people, if yeah, not right, and, all uh, right, talking it, between them. And the fact that they just stopped just kind of felt. Yeah, fake. like yeah, I'm watching a gift it... play and repeat of a couple seconds here, and it's yeah, they're uh, they are just statues, mm-hmm. and half the time they're not even looking at the jacks. Yeah, yeah, it's... like if it was supposed to be that, like once the rift actually does open. That it somehow does, because that's like, the other funny like thing. It's like time that wouldn't work either. Remember, yeah, yeah, because yeah, right. like, um, like if the if opening the rift is what freezes the crowd, it's like, well, technically, wouldn't it have frozen like the real Captain Jack as well? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, no, because yeah, he was in physical contact with a time traveler, so that's not the best uh, that's logic, some, that's but it's logic. Have, we... It's it's logic yeah. Doctor Who has used in the past, and I would have accepted. I it. suppose. Yeah. Well, it's also it's also. <laughs> Let's face facts. It's also uh, hand waviness that even Star Trek has used. Mm. But yeah, it's like just... the fact that there, the fact that there weren't even like sort of uh, monocle popping like gasps and shit was mm-hmm. kind of interesting because yeah. like it would have been accurate for the time. <laughs> like the fact that no one, like yeah, like I could kind of get that by, by virtue of the real Captain Jack being a high enough ranking guy compared to everyone else, they would like not attack him, but they would at least be either saying something or be gasping and like look sort of horrified. <laughs> All right, so we are um, down to about four minutes left because we spent a little too much time on Geek Talk. Yep. <laughs> um, let's wrap this up with our final thoughts really quick, Thomas. Yep. Uh. Yeah. Like, I don't know. This well, this isn't not not like a bad episode by any stretch. This was just one of those episodes where it it was very hard to get it to hold my attention <laughs> compared to some other ones. Um. To the point that I was like, "Wow, not really much happened in this." I guess <laughs> for me to like just sort of coast by i mean i'd seen it before but not that recently um so yeah like i mean it's kind of required viewing if you're gonna watch the whole show um uh especially if you're gonna watch the the series one finale because it sets up a character that shows up in the very next episode but yeah Otherwise, at least from this viewing, it's like, yeah, for whatever reason, it just didn't hold my attention as much. Um, as as nice as like, there's some good stuff in there and whatever. Like, yeah, it just it didn't hold my attention as much as I thought it might. Okay, Matt. Um, I will say that this is a very good character piece for a couple of characters, including the setup for the uh, villain for the end of the season. Um, I will say, however, that there's a few things that didn't quite execute right. And there's the usual obvious Owen in the room. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, Bill. Um, so, yeah, I agree with uh, a lot of what Matt said. It's a fairly solid episode. I would have enjoyed it more with a little less Owen and more Tosh. However, um, we really needed what Owen did in order to set up the following episode. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do wish they had executed it just a little bit better. Um, There seems to have been some sort of production constraints that might have been involved there, but that doesn't, uh, that doesn't mean they couldn't have written Owen a little, you know, a little more reasonably and a little less of a shithead. Um, But in general, it's a pretty, pretty good episode. There are only minor changes that I would want to see. That's all, all right. I agree with the same thing. It was a decent episode. Um, I could have used a lot less Owen, but he had to be there because they're wrapping up the season plot line. And I believe the issue is largely with the direction rather than the writing. I think they mm, either possibly. had a unseasoned director or somebody who just didn't know how to deal with what they were given. Because while some scenes are beautiful and perfect, there are those just those moments that could have used a little more polish and that could have really helped 
Okay, let's rate this. Thomas, you are rating first. Uh, I could go a slightly lower, but that seems a bit mean considering I would argue that it's my own fault that I couldn't pay attention. So I will go with a 3.5. All right. And Matt? I'm leaning towards four. Bill? I would say from the comments I gave, it makes most sense to be a 4.5. And I am kind of bouncing between 3.5 and 4. I think I'll go with 4 because that will leave us a average of 4. <laughs> and this is kind of a meh, good, not great. It's so good. It's, it's fairly good, not great. 4.0 will put us at... 192 out of 405 things reviewed, so just barely above the halfway line. Um, putting it there is on par with K9 the Bounty Hunter, um, Sarah Jane Adventures, The Wedding of Sarah Jane Smith, and Revenge of the Slovene. Um, it is better than. Sarah Jane Adventures Invasion of the Bane and not as good as Torchwood End of Days <laughs> which comes in at 4.1 so there you have it once again 192 out of 405 that is all we have to say about Torchwood Captain Jack Harkness Oh, uh, yep. Don't forget. Sorry, I was. I was. In, I was like, let Randy, was like, let Randy finish, and I forgot. I still had things to say. Uh, but yes, please comment below. Let us know what you think about this episode. Don't forget to uh, like the video and subscribe on YouTube to get our exports every Monday, and follow us on Twitch to see our streams every Tuesday night. All right. From here, next week we are going to move on and continue our uh, foray into series two of Torchwood. We have already reviewed the first episode as part of our uh, uh, mind of uh, our uh, cranium of Chibnall, Chibnall, I think, yeah. way back uh, before uh, Series 11. So we will instead do the second episode of Series 2, which is Sleeper, which is written by James Morin and starring John Barrowman as Captain Jack Harkness, Eve Miles as Gwen Cooper. Burn Gorman as Owen Harper, Naoko Mori as Tosiko Sato, and Gareth David Lloyd as Ianto Jones. We will see you next week. Good night. God bless. See you all next time.